The scripture reading this morning is from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. The Holy Spirit, through Paul, says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand firm. Amen. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end keep alert with all perseverance making supplication for all the saints amen god bless the reading of his word morning mesa church of christ so good to see all of you. I am a reverse engineer guy, so I like to think about what's the end result and how are we going to then reverse engineer back where we are to get us where we want to be. And so Dave and I collaborated earlier this week to begin our Ephesians series in uh, at the end. <laughs> so he read from chapter 6 this morning, uh, and uh, that's where we're going to end up. Uh, six lessons from today. And so we're going to back up this morning and go back to uh, Ephesians chapter 1. And so we're going to start there and would encourage you to uh, take your Bibles out and um, journey with me through this study that we're calling In This Together. And I so appreciate the comments Clint made during our communion time. It just fits beautifully. The song selection today, Gabby, thank you. So we are starting a study on the book of Ephesians, and um, I want to give you just a little bit of a a backdrop. Um, Ephesus uh, was a huge city by ancient standards. Um, Most archaeologists uh, have deemed that there were about a quarter million people. That's a big town by today's standards, right? But in ancient times, a city of 250,000 people was, was huge. Um, it, was, it was really a focal point of Greek and Roman worship, multiple temples that were there. Almost every god in the pantheon of Greek and Roman worship was in one way or another represented there. Um, and, and Paul spent, as best we can determine, about three years there. We'll say a little bit more about that here in just a moment. Uh, but because of his ministry there, there were all kinds of people who gave their lives to Jesus um, and uh, Ephesians, the, the letter to the Ephesians, which ultimately becomes the book of Ephesians, well, that letter was written while Paul was in prison in Rome several years after he visited there in person. Um, Ephesians chapters 1 through 3, and we're going to begin today in chapter 1, but Ephesians chapter 1 through 3 deal with, with who we are in Christ and that's a theme we're going to talk about some this morning. Uh, this is how much God loves you is, is very key to these opening verses and permeates these first three chapters. And then chapters 4, 5, and 6 are a little more practical. Basically, this word, therefore, 
uh, right smack in the middle of the letter becomes a launch pad into, okay, everything that I've told you, now this is what it looks like lived out, and we'll get there uh, in a few weeks. So, in essence, Paul writes, I just want you to understand how much you're loved. I want you to understand the price that was paid for you. And when you understand that, well, now I want you to go live it out uh, as a disciple of Jesus Christ. So I'm really looking forward to this journey through the book of Ephesians with you. The letter is written to a community, not to an individual. And it's a letter about how we become God's family and how we live as God's family. Ephesians will showcase how we are related to God as Father and how we're related to one another in Christ as brothers and sisters through the power of God's Holy Spirit. In some ways, I think Ephesians, it's kind of like a family tree that comes with its own user's manual, okay? So if that's how I could describe this letter, that's, that's it. It's like, here's your ancestry, and here's how you live in your ancestry, okay? So that's about as basic as I can, as I can summarize it. Just a couple other things, and then we'll actually get into the text. So when this text would have been shared with a church in the first century, most likely the entire letter would have been read in one sitting, okay? That was very common, for how letters were circulated in the church or in churches uh, during uh, the time when Paul lived and even after his life when his letters continued to be circulated to churches. Uh, But we're going to break protocol a little bit, and we're going to break it down into some more digestible chunks over these next several Sundays. Ephesians is six chapters long. There's just over 3,000 words in this very, very short letter. However, Some commentaries on this one book are over 500 pages long. Some commentaries are so long they're actually broken into two sets, okay? So here's why I tell you that. I will not do this book justice with a sermon series. I could preach on this one letter probably for two or three years. Ashby, could I get an amen on that? There is so much In this one letter, it's just so incredibly powerful, but we're going to let these words wash over us, wash over our minds, wash over our hearts, and we're going to pray for transformation as disciples of Jesus Christ uh, as we spend time in this letter, not just in the sermon. I'm going to challenge you to be in this book in your own personal prayer time and your own personal study time over the next several weeks as well. Some of you may have one of your favorite places to visit. Anybody have a favorite city? Yeah? My wife and I believe that we were born in the wrong century and in the wrong country. We love uh, London, England. We love to visit London. Now, we're big history buffs, okay? And we've actually physically only been over there once. We watch a lot of British TV, so we think we know it probably better than we do, okay? But Paul loves Ephesus. He loves it. And not just because of the architecture, and it was grand. All that's left these days is just ruins of the ancient city. But even if you just take a look at those ruins, it was a magnificent place. But that's not why Paul loved Ephesus, I don't think. He loved Ephesus first and foremost because of the relationships that he had there with people who were very, very near and very dear to his heart. And I think all of us can relate to that, right? You know, teenagers who have their BFFs, right? Their best friends forever. And and some of us who are older, who've got friends that we love and we've, we've, we've been in the trenches with. And so all of us can relate to Paul here as he loves these people. If we go back to Acts chapters 18 and 19 and 20, we're exposed to Paul spending some time there on his second and third missionary journeys. We read the following in Acts chapter 19, starting in verse 1. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior, and he arrived at Ephesus. Paul entered 
the synagogue, we read later, and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate, and they refused to believe, and they publicly maligned the way. And so Paul left them, and he took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. And this went on for two years, two years worth of lectures, and you think I preach long, right? This is amazing. This is amazing. But I want you to notice what happens. So that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. You know all is an absolute term, right? That's a lot of people that are exposed to and who believe in the word of the Lord, many of them. Verses 11 and 12, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Wow. So Paul loves Ephesus. God did amazing things through Paul in Ephesus. We were to go on, we'll actually come back and reference this later, the love that he had for the elders, the the collaboration, the companionship. A lot of fun things happened there. A lot of not so fun things happened there too. (laughs) We'll talk about that in the next couple of weeks. So today's sermon, I'm structuring this a little bit differently. I could could stand up here this morning and I could just... We could make this an information transfer, okay? I could read the text to you and I could say, and this is what it means, and and you could go, okay, yeah, that's what it means. I want to do something a little bit different today. I actually want to hopefully prayerfully position you to take this text and interact with it beyond today. So we are going to transfer some information, but I, I hope and pray that it will be more than that for you and I'll explain it as we go along. We're going to try to mine truths from four sections. Now, I had to pull the quintessential preacher move this morning and go with alliteration, okay? So I'm giving you four Ps here as a little bit of a mnemonic device. Paul starts with a prologue, and then he moves to praise. And right after praise, he goes into a prayer, and the basis of all of this is the power of God. And so those are the four sections we're going to briefly examine today, and then I have a few takeaways for you that I hope will bless you and encourage you, and not just you, but those also within your circles of influence. So Paul begins in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, in this prologue, these first two verses, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful In Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't have anything really profound to say here other than this. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that just beautiful? Powerful, life-changing words. One phrase that really got my mind or got my attention here and just kind of kind of piqued my interest is this phrase, grace and peace from God and Jesus. And he could have focused on anything, right? He could have focused on any attribute of God, any characteristic of God, any transformative part of God, but he focuses on grace and he focuses on peace. It was very common when Christians entered the household of other Christians, when Jews entered the household of other Jews, to speak shalom over that household. As an introduction, just like you and I might say hello, it was very common for them to walk into one another's homes and say, may the peace of God be on this house. So just like that, hi, how are you? (laughs) Paul starts with grace and peace. The unmerited favor of God be upon you. The shalom of Christ Jesus be upon you. It's just beautiful. I think about the interactions that we have with one another. And what if in our greetings, even if we don't say it out loud, we're praying over one another the grace of God? We're praying over one another the peace of God. I think there's something here worthy of imitation. He continues in verse 
three as we move into um, this next section and focus for a few moments on praise. Um, I want to make an observation. Paul actually creates this in a, in a Jewish poetic style. And so it's, it's bracketed in some ways with the beginning and the end, and, and it flows very much like a Jewish poem would flow. Um, and he's, he's uh, praising God, and I want to ask you to consider a question with me as we read through these next few verses. What exactly is he praising God for? So what is Paul praising God for? Let's see what the text says. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. Now, I want you to notice one key theme that Paul immediately puts into play. I've circled a couple of phrases here. In Christ, in Him, in Jesus Christ. So there's one key theme that is abundantly clear. Paul wants believers to know that they are in Christ. In Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 14, the phrase, in Christ, appears one way or another 11 times. You think Paul wants you to know? Kids, have you ever had your parents tell you something 11 times in one conversation? Why do they do that? Because they want you to know it, right? They want you to get it. They want you to understand it. Paul wants us to know it. And what he wants us to know is we are part of the family of God. We are not on the outside looking in. Now, one of the things that I also look for when I study Scripture, I always try to look for absolutes. And there are a few in this entire passage, but but even in this opening section, there are a few that really get my attention. All definitely reasons for praying God. I want you to notice. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with, say that word with me, every spiritual blessing in Christ. Look at these other absolutes. He chose us in Him before. That's a designated time, an absolute time, before the creation of the world, to be holy, not partially holy, not a little bit holy, but absolutely holy. Blame less. There's another absolute in His sight. I also want to invite you to notice some of the pronouns that he uses over and over and over in this section. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ, for he chose us before him. As we go on and on and on, we're going to see multiple plural pronouns in this passage. In these opening verses, I think Paul is, is moving in and out of audiences, and sometimes it's a little bit difficult to understand. Is he talking about God's covenant people, the Jews? Uh, is he talking about uh, all covenant people, Jews and Gentiles? Is he speaking specifically to the Gentiles? There are, some, there are some shifts and some cues that allow us to understand. Ultimately, ultimately, he's talking about everybody, everybody who is in Christ. But in these opening verses, he he seems to be specifically dressing covenant language related to Jewish people. Later in verse 13, he's going to say, you also. So there's kind of when we see the switch flip, right, to talking about everybody else. Um, But he's meaning here that because of the love of God manifested in the sacrifice of Christ, all believers, all believers, are brought into God's covenant family through the sacrifice of Jesus and through the work of the Holy Spirit. So I want to dig a little bit deeper. These are not just absolutes. These are absolutes from the creator of the universe. A being who is not just described in 1 John 4, 8 as a God who loves, but a God who is love. And what is the greatest possible expression of this love? Is it not the offering of His Son, Jesus? 
And I think that makes possible what Paul describes next as we continue in the latter part of verse 4. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. So, church, before before He created us. God was pleased to provide a a pathway to become part of His family. Now, I want to show you a picture of my family. This is my uh, wife and our twin sons, Will and Riley, and Hillary and Alyssa, and our grandchildren, uh, Evie and and Caden. And so we took this picture a few few months back uh, in the blazing sun of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, But... I love my family. I've made sacrifices for my family. But the love that I have for my family and the sacrifices that I've made for my family pales in comparison to the love and the sacrifice of Jesus, who is God's Son. His blood, the blood of Christ, is the ink on my adoption papers as a son of God to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves Ephesians 1 6 not only am I a part of God's family through his blood the text continues in him we have redemption through his blood The forgiveness of sins and redemption is a word that basically just means bought and paid for again, okay? (laughs) Bought and paid for again, bought back, basically is what that word means. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. I absolutely love that phrase. God's grace that he lavished on us. Some translations say God's grace that is poured out on us or that is showered on us. I just think it's one of the most beautiful pictures in all of Scripture. The text continues, With all wisdom and understanding he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. I want to ask you to please pay very close attention to these words in verse 10. To bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Christ Jesus is supreme He is the Lord of all. He is over all. We'll spend quite a bit of time talking about that over the next several weeks. But Paul does something here I think that's quite unique. If he were a chef, if Paul were a chef, he would have just described all of the ingredients in the most delicious main dish in the history of the universe, spiritually speaking, okay? All these ingredients appear throughout the rest of the letter. So for now, I just invite you to savor them. Any of you, when your significant other is cooking, go in and stick your finger in the bowl and put it in your mouth and go, mmm, that tastes good. Okay? Here's the good news today. You're not going to get your hand slapped if you stick your finger in the bowl. Okay? So let these words, let these verses just... Just don't be afraid to engage them. Enjoy them. If Paul has mixed these amazing amazing ingredients, he now puts everything into the oven, okay? And I want you to notice the result. I want you to notice what, what comes out, this feast that we are invited to be a part of as members of God's family. In verse 11, in him... We were also chosen, having been predestined, according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, 
who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of His glory. And he makes this transition now. He's again used multiple pronouns here to describe multiple people, but at the same time, he's describing all people who are part of God's family. He specifically turns his attention to the Gentiles. And he says, and you also, you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. And he puts all of this in magnificent bookends in verses 3 through 14. He begins with praise to the Father and praise to the Son, and he concludes with praise to the Spirit in verses 13 and 14. And so it's just this beautifully designed opening here that hopefully, prayerfully, certainly gets our attention. Okay, so I said I didn't just want today to be an information transfer. So I want to invite you to do something with this text this week. I'm going to ask you to take Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, and where you see all of these plural pronouns, I'm going to ask you to read this text, and wherever you see a plural pronoun, I'm going to ask you, as you read it sometimes, to put your own name in there. And I also want to invite you to put the names of other people in your circles of influence. I want to ask you to put their name in there as well. I think if you practice this over time, you will see yourself quite differently. I think you'll see others quite differently than how the enemy wants you to see yourself and how the enemy wants you to see yourself others. Brad Curley did a magnificent job this morning presenting the information to you. For those of you who were here during the Bible class hour, I think you would give me a hearty amen on that, right? Fantastic job. So I'm going to borrow my brother Brad's name for just a moment, and I'm going to show you how this might work in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed Brad in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose Brad in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. And I could go on and on and on. But do you see how this might work powerfully? If I'm actually speaking the name of my brothers or my sisters or even if I go ahead and put my own name in there to realize how worthy I am because of what Christ has done, not because of what I have done. I think if I ingrain exercises like this into my thought processes over time, it's going to be really hard for me to ever be upset with Brad. Okay? That's going to be tough. He and I should be able to work anything out. Why? Because we're brothers in the Lord. And this text tells me that is true. And that should make all the difference. Husbands, put your wife's name in this text. Wives, put your husband's name in this text. Parents, put your children's name here. Children, put your parents' name here. I I think it could be a transformative practice if we would just give it an opportunity. We continue in Ephesians Chapter 1, verse 15, as we look for a few moments at what we see in section 3, prayer. For this reason, because you are included in Christ, Paul says, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. So the Ephesian church has a reputation There's some characteristics, there's some hallmarks that as Paul dwells on it and thinks about it, it leads him to praise. It leads him to constant thanksgiving for the Ephesian church. And so I have a couple of questions for you, Mesa Church of Christ. Um, 
What do people hear about you? What are the characteristics that describe you? What's your reputation? If Paul were writing a letter to you, what would he be giving thanks to God for? Uh, what do you want people to hear? Okay, I'm going to give you some really simple advice here. Do the things you want them to hear about. That's what you need to do as a church. What do you want people to hear about you? Well, do those things. That's what believers in Ephesus were doing. And it resonated to the very heart of an apostle of our Lord. Here's what he prays, beginning in verse 17. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance and his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. There's a couple of key words there that you may know the hope. Paul is praying that they would know hope. And what does the word hope mean? Anybody know? Hope means it's okay to talk in church. What does it mean? Confident expectation. Confident expectation. There's a difference in hoping and wishing. Okay? Hope is a phenomenon for believers that is a result of who we are in the Lord, that we confidently expect uh, that to which we have been called. And His incomparably great power. Man, his incomparable. I'm going, to, I'm going to transition here because we're going to talk about power next. But before we get there, here's another spiritual exercise I want to encourage you to consider. I want this text to come alive for you this week. Take Ephesians 1, 15 through the first part of verse 19, and pray this prayer. Pray it for yourself, and I encourage you to pray it for others. I'm going to Pick on another committee member because she's a very strong woman and she'll be okay with this. So, Gwen, I'm, I'm going to use you this morning as part of, my, part of my example. Think about our sister Gwen McNeil. I just want to just pray this prayer right now from Ephesians 1.17. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give my sister Gwen, the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that she can know him better. I pray that the eyes of Gwen's heart may be enlightened in order that she may know the hope to which Jesus has called her, the riches of his glorious inheritance and his holy people and his incomparably great power for Gwen and all of us who believe. You see the difference that that could make? Not only in somebody else's life, but in your own prayer life. Pray that prayer over your children. Pray it over your parents. Pray it over your neighbors. Pray it over your coworkers and friends. Let's not just learn the history of this text, but, but let's put the power of this text into practice. So this text continues, the latter part of verse 19 through um, the end of the chapter, that incomparably great power, um, 19 through 23, that incomparably great power is the same as the mighty strength. Whew, boy, this is, a, this is amazing insight. That incomparably great power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. And seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. What do you know? More absolutes. <laughs> and God placed, notice this, God placed all things under his feet. And appointed him to be head over everything for the church, 
which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. There is doctrine here, and some of you who may be new to the church, you may have heard this word doctrine, and you're like, what does that word, what does that word mean? Um, it, it's a word that just basically, as simply as I can say it, doctrine means what the Bible teaches, okay? The doctrine of the Bible is the teaching of the Bible, okay? So we talk about healthy doctrine, we talk about healthy teaching of Scripture, so there's doctrine in this passage that I don't think we can overlook. Paul notes everything has been done and is complete in Christ. Many of us were raised to believe that properly focusing on the Christian life focuses on doing. It begins with focusing on doing. But Paul makes it very clear in chapter 1, proper focus begins with centering on what has been done in Christ. You see the difference? In a sense, Paul sets a theological table, and he invites us to sit down and enjoy all that God has done for us in Christ. He is Lord. He is Messiah. He is conqueror. By grace, we rest in him. And, and that's where true works of faith come from. If we miss this truth, then living the Christian life can just turn into scorekeeping. And Paul warns against that over and over again. See Ephesians 2.15. See Galatians 3.3, 3, if you don't believe me. I live my life the way that I do because I know how much I am loved and I know who is the Lord of my life and praise be to God a spiritual exercise I've given you two here's the third consider reading Ephesians 1 the last part of verse 19 through verse 23 every morning this next week as you begin your day and I want to ask you to start making a list of all that you can think of that has been done uh, for you in Christ. What is the power of God that you see revealed as you reflect on all that has been done in Christ? So you have some exercises to consider this week, okay? I'm inviting you and giving you a free pass to the spiritual gym, all right? So interact with this text and let's see what God does with it. We are in this together. But here's the great news, church. We're in this together through the power of Jesus Christ. And that's the same power. That's the same power that raised Christ from the dead. There is nothing that cannot be overcome because of who Christ is and because of who we are in him. Next Sunday, we're going to have a little history lesson. And we're also going to have a geography lesson for disciples of Jesus Christ. So I want to talk to you next week about where you've been and where you live. But I want to leave you with this challenge. Please don't be satisfied with just coming in and sitting down and receiving information. I want to encourage you to do something with it this week. Practice the disciplines I mentioned in our sermon where Paul uses pronouns for believers, insert your name, insert the names of others. Where Paul, Paul prays for the Ephesians, insert the names of others uh, and, and, and pray uh, the same prayer over them. Take inventory this week of where you see God's power on display and write it out. And I look forward to hearing about your experiences with these exercises over the next several weeks. We're going to share a song together uh, this morning. If you uh, want to be baptized and have your sins washed away, if you want that lavish grace of God to just be poured out upon you, then what a blessing that would be before we leave this place today. If there's anything else that you need this morning, a prayer uh, for any reason, whatever it is, then we're going to ask you just to make your way down to the front. Some of our shepherds will be here after our assembly. I'll be back in the lobby and be happy to talk to you back there as well. Let's stand together and let's sing. In need of grace, in need of love, in need of mercy, rain down from high above, in need of strength, in need of peace, in need of faith.
Mother.